All right, we are back, ready for another episode. Uh, my competitive marching band season is done, uh, thankfully, which is also kind of ironic because I was just literally watching band on the flow stream a minute ago for oh, yeah. the Grand BOA's National this Finals. Weekend, so, isn't it? yeah, I completely like, forgot you think about I have that. enough band. You Dude, think I, I had enough band, but. Sometimes I watch some of those high schools. I'm like, dang, kids can actually do this stuff, which is really impressive and really cool and really inspirational. But, yeah, I'm glad the competitive season is over Yeah, because uh, it's too cold where we live to, to be outside. No, completely, completely. We went down to, like we do every year, I think we were it was Murfreesboro this year for a contest of champions, I think, the circuit or the show. It was like a one-off thing. It was fun. It was cool. A little warmer, thank God, because like you said, it's – I think we were just talking before we started recording, and it was 14 degrees in Kentucky like two days ago, something like that. Brutal. Brutal, yep. bro. There's a reason but drum corps in the summer. No band. Uh, all right. So welcome, everyone, to the Aged Out Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Fantini, and with me, as always, is... Evan Worrell. And today's guest is one that we've been... Well, I'll say it this way. We've been needing to get out of our comfort zone of the Midwest, and as much as I love those guys, Carolina Crown staff. Yeah, but like Mike was saying, we've been trying to get away from our, our kind of uh, close circle of friends and expand, so we we're finally able, able to make it out west. Uh, we had been in contact with Eric Shriver for a little bit, but Eric just had a kid, so life's, uh, life's hectic for him right now. Yeah. Not but a lot of free time. We love you, Eric. Congrats on the kid. But we are able to uh, snag... Uh, a guy that we both know in uh, Richard Ramos, who's joining us today, and actually suggested by one of our Instagram followers, who I guess is a student or friend of Richard's. It's like, hey, you guys should have Richard on, or if you go by Rich, we'll, we'll settle that here in a minute. But we we're like, you know what? Mike and I were like, we should have Richard on. Um, Richard's wife, Vanessa, shout out to her, actually designed our Aged Out podcast logo and did a killer job. It was so easy to work with her. Um, Venmo is a beautiful thing. That oh, yeah. was super easy. <laughs> Convenient. But uh, yeah, we were able to to snag and catch up with Richard, and he was graceful and enough to to join us and make the time to sit down with us. So thanks for joining us, bro. Thanks for having me, man. I'm really honored to be on the podcast. Yeah, man. Like we were saying, I, I'm sure that you're warmer degrees. You were saying it's like 50 out there. I'm sure people are freaking out and putting on their their heavy coats, but. Yeah, it's definitely not nearly as cold as, as you guys. It's at lowest, I think, about 50 to 55. <laughs> Man. Yeah, well, <laughs> location, 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 as they say. Yeah. So. But cool, man. Uh, yeah, so we'll uh, we'll get a little bit of your background. There's some stuff that we want to get into just because, obviously, I think the furthest west we've gone at this point with guests is uh, Taha down in Texas. Yeah, yeah but I think obviously Texas there's is... A, there's a different culture of band and drumline and just music and education and pedagogy that seems to come along sometimes between East Coast and West Coast. So we'll dig into that here in a little bit. But uh, for now, just I guess tell us a little bit about yourself, like your introduction maybe to music or band or drumline. Uh, we'll do we'll do a quick bio and then we'll get into some stuff, man. Word. Um, well, introduction to bands was really just kind of a stumbling upon things uh i just really needed to take a class in middle school so i actually started at this new school i was in private school for the longest time uh ended up in public school in seventh grade just kind of stumbled upon uh beginning bands kind of where it all started in terms of the marching band thing just went to a band show one day and was already hooked um started off playing bass drum in high school that was fun Ended up having to make the switch over to quads just because that, you know, normal ranking, moving people up sort of business. Um, transitioned over to snare drum and never looked back. <laughs> so like so if I read this right in some of your bio, you learned from a, uh, a pair of, like, was it brothers? Is that right? Twins. Yeah, twin uh, I, I noticed they had the same last name, Kersey, C U R C I. Yeah. All right, everyone calls them like Kirchy or Courtsy or whatever. But, yeah, yeah uh, right. Paul and I don't remember the almost name. Nick. Okay, all right. I wanted to say Nick, but I was like, that sounds too basic. All right, Paul and Nick. And so those dudes, I guess, were from 
kind of like the early stages of Pulse, or at least Paul was. Is that right? Yeah, they're actually charter members of Pulse Percussion back in the day in 05. Um, they with also, Eric Schreiber. Yeah, with Eric Schreiber and all, and all those big names that you hear around the, around the activity still. But they were the big reason why I got into DCI in the first place, because Nick was actually a bass drummer for Blue Coats in 06. And then Paul was a snare, uh, snare drummer for Vanguard in 06 as well. Could have done 07, but decided to bow out early. But well, been there, done that. I bowed out early too, so I can't blame yeah. him. Actually, yeah, totally. Dude, uh, Blue Coats 06, that was the, uh, was that the, it wasn't the Carnet. Uh, I think it was. I can't yeah, remember I the names. Bricky what Marsh, that show. What you're I know. about to say, I think, what was it, 06 was. Carn something. Carn, yeah. Was it a Carnival? Did do a show like that? Carnival or something. I can yeah. hear it in my head, but I can't think of the show title. <laughs> all I know is That's that all right. the guy that, that was my first snare tech at Blue Stars, um, was in that snare line and that if i remember right that was one heck of a drum line in general Mm -hmm. oh yeah they were like i want to say like at one of those shows like top three or two and like hands on the field or something but they were good yeah and also a funny side note when i was researching the 05 pulse because i didn't realize that it had kicked in that early i guess in open class before they had two groups is that they actually wore like earmuffs like mystique did this past winter and i was like pulse was the og earmuff wearers <laughs> mystique's just so, copying yeah. man nothing original <laughs> that was pretty funny <laughs> it's kind of funny um, like uh paul would actually tell us stories about how they had to drill holes so that they could actually hear each other hmm. they had to drill holes in the actual earmuffs themselves otherwise they were just totally screwed <laughs> yeah i mean the, you're wearing noise canceling i mean they're canceling the noise there's no way like that would just be a complete detriment to what we try to do yeah. <laughs> but uh so yeah man so from cali did that did the high school band thing when did you like did paul and them i guess introduce you to like the wgi dci scene yeah we ended up going to dayton my first year in high school which was kind of a kind of a lucky break there um Saw Pulse and everyone there, and a great year. 07 was was awesome. Immediately was attracted to Pulse just because Paul and Nick were there, and that was like, oh, I want to end up doing Pulse because my instructors ended up doing it. Um, watched RCC in the lot that year. That was fantastic, dude. I think one of my favorite shows, though, was with the Mex that year, uh, Behind the Velvet Rope, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was a sick show. Ended up being taught by Jared Thomas later on down the road, kind of a. Kind oh, I love Jared so much. He's he is easily one of my like favorite people I met through my time at Blue Coats and Rhythm X. Like he's just an all around in general great dude. Like there's mm-hmm. n- nothing more to say about it. Him and I actually message each other pretty frequently, even though he's in Australia right now. Yeah. It's usually him. It consists of us sending extremely uh, ridiculous. Uh, I'll use that adjective, ridiculous videos of people doing dumb stuff on Instagram <laughs> mixed with uh, mixed with videos of like Chino Hills, like just Throwing blowing down. our mind. But <laughs> but yeah, so Jared Thomas, so, the one and only. So mm-hmm. it was Pulse from day one for you. There was never like a desire to, man, maybe I'll do RCC, maybe jump back and forth like some people have done. It was Pulse all the way. Yeah, it was Pulse, ride or die from day one. Um, just kind of set the standard from there. I never really thought about, you know, maybe trying to do RCC or even let alone like what people are doing now and moving halfway across the country yeah. to another group, you know, to, yeah. yeah. It, it was just pulse at that point because it was just such a great experience. It was a game changer in my life. So yeah. And awesome. you, your first year with them was in when they were still in open class. Is that right? Or yeah, you were that, in the open group. Correct. I'm a charter member of pulse open the only open class metal they have <laughs> before they got bumped before they got yeah, bumped. exactly yeah. <laughs> before they totally just blew that out of the water and got bumped to world class <laughs> um, but yeah that, that was a good time it was definitely a really challenging experience to say the least you know first year group in open class having no idea how things are going to go um a bunch of people that just got cut from Pulse and we're all just kind of here like, well, what's up, everyone? <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it happen. So it worked out, though. It was a great time, great experience to learn 
uh, like learned what to do, what not to do. Cause that was my first independent experience really ever. So, um, a lot of learning curves for everyone involved, designers, instructors, members. So, yeah, sure. I think, I think the open class experience is extremely valuable. Like making the jump for kids going from like high school to like, what do I do next? I mean, I did open class indoor for three years before I ended up doing like, I guess what's world-class DCI or whatever you want to consider it. But there is a lot to learn from that or just like develop skill wise of like, Oh, now we actually have to do drill. That's not quote unquote, like high school band drumline drill where the drumline's just kind of in a staple moving back and forth across the back. I mean, it's more developed now, but like when we were in high school, it was like, Oh, we're in the back. Like we're doing this. We're not doing much bodies. Like, Oh, I got to do choreography now. What's this? Like, mm -hmm. so I think that that experience is super valuable. Yeah, definitely. So that was 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, Pulse Open got bumped to Pulse Open World, so they just call themselves Pal. Uh, then you did the uh, the Mandarin's gig, right? Yeah, that was that was a another awesome experience. First time ever doing drum corps. Um, Paul Kersey, the instructor from high school, was actually co-caption head at the time at Mandarin. So he was like, "Hey, we have a few spots open. Still looking for people. Do you want to come march?" And I was like, "Well." Sure. I don't know what I'm getting myself into, but yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so that ended up working out. Great time. Had no idea what I was doing at all. Uh, a lot of bumps and bruises along the way, but you know, learned a lot. Definitely grew a lot. Uh, I definitely didn't really feel like I got much better in terms of the hands because I was just trying to figure out the mental part of it. I was just trying to figure out everything else. So I was totally overwhelmed. I ended up getting better just because I got a lot of reps. That's for sure, you know, as yeah. people normally do. But um, that's what I tell yeah. everybody. Like, even if you don't get to, anything. even if you don't get to march where you want to march in the end, your first summer, like you're gonna get better by default just from the sheer number of repetitions. No matter who your instructors are, no matter who, well, how the show designed or the quality of the drum line, like you're going to improve. You can't do something for eighty something days and not get better at it exactly just yeah reps cure all i always yep. say that reps cure all like whatever <laughs> even in world class like just just give us the reps man we just gotta figure it out like let yep. me figure it out so uh, are you just letting them get reps on it on their own is even more of a better solution sometimes with world class and older performers just because they're more experienced they're going to be able to fix and work out some kinks on their own just from doing mm. it like less can definitely be more as an instructor when you're working with older members yeah no one else knows their hands better than the person playing the instrument yep you know yeah heck yeah uh, uh so you did pull or mandarins that was the summer of 2011 right yes went back for went. the summer well, I guess then in between then it would be 2012 winter. Mm -hmm. Made the bump to uh, Pulse World Class, mm -hmm. even though they're both uh, <laughs> 2012. What show was that? That was Coming and Going. Coming uh, and Going. March yeah. with Manny. I did. Dude, the most his hands move like butter. Winner. The most intimidating know. winner of my life. Oh, <laughs> man. Like, <laughs> this guy had been my idol forever. Like, just I watched him through... Uh, Vanguard in 07, 08, 09, you know, like that's the guy I want to be. Uh, ended up marching next to him, and God, that dude is the most intimidating person behind a drum, but the nicest guy as soon as you get outside of the band stuff. It was funny. I saw his INE solo from 09. Uh, I, yeah, he marched Vanguard that summer, and I was sitting there watching the solo, and I was like, at, of course, this was, like, after the summer was over. Like, we ended up doing better than them overall, like, as a core and a percussion ensemble. But right. I was just watching that dude play, and I was like, I'll never be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> my hands just my hands just don't move like that. Uh, I That was not in my bag as a, a solo player, but I just watched him. I was like, man, everything, the sound quality just sounds so good, <laughs> even though he's just chopping out like crazy right now. So, yeah, I can see how that would be intimidating. Yep. Yeah. He might be the best snare drummer I've ever seen. 
Like, I don't watch a lot of solos or watch a lot of guys play on their own, but he may be, like, the absolute best, like, rudimental snare drummer I've ever seen. Yeah, I've got a list. I, yeah. yeah. A list. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a, a, a good list for sure. I think in terms of, like, my age category, I feel like he's definitely one of the one of the best that we I think we've ever seen. Kind of yeah. like in sports where you have, like, your quote-unquote goats of mm -hmm. your era. Yeah. I think he's definitely in that top tier. Like you're arguing like '90s MJ versus today's LeBron versus yes. what like or whatever. I mean, exactly. It's hard, man. It's hard. Yep. So you did your full first year of Pulse, then you went back and were the section leader for Mandarins. Yes. Right. Yeah. Was that like so? Your first year, and I can kind of I guess relate to this a little bit, because your first year you feel like you're just a drum corps trying to figure it out. Like, what do I do each day? Like. I don't want to mess up. I don't want. I don't want to be that guy. Mm -hmm. So that's a mental anxiety in and of itself. And then your second year, you're put in a leadership position, a section leader position, and you have this other list of responsibilities. And then the anxiety for that is just like, oh god, now I gotta like be nails all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how was that summer? Oh man, uh, great and. Definitely, again, intimidating going into everything that you just said, where it was, you have a, a bunch of responsibility now being, quote unquote, the guy. But the cool part is that the section leader from the year before was also back that year. Um, he was definitely able to help out in terms of um, what to do, what not to do, what decisions to make. It was, it was definitely a team effort. And what was cool about that group in general is that we were just super young. So we all just kind of had to figure it out together. It was definitely a team effort to make sure that that summer ran as smooth as possible. There were a lot of like-minded people that definitely, I guess, never really tried to step out of their role, per se. You know, they, they didn't try and cross boundaries. They didn't want to step on anyone's toes. It was just keep the blinders on, do your job, and do it really well. Um, Manny having just aged out and being the snare tech that year was a huge help because he was giving us guidance left and right. Um, having the same caption head from year to year was also really nice. So um, just having that rapport and that comfortability definitely helped the overall vibe. Uh, yeah, the, the experience was great. I met Vanessa that summer as well. So that was a huge, huge, huge plus <laughs> but, yeah did you guys like meet on tour at camp or well what's funny is that we were actually trying to figure out a housing situation because at the time the the mandarins were doing the whole like you have to find your own housing in the area and then we'll come together and rehearse at a central location so we as a drum line we're trying to figure out can we rent an apartment for like two months or something like that so she hit me up on facebook and just kind of said, hey, this guy, who was one of the quad players at the time, a good friend of hers, um, recommended that I talk to you about housing and whatnot. And I was like, oh, we're trying to do this, this, this. And, you know, we just kind of started talking from there. I actually met for the first time, I think, at the April camp. She'll always say that we met in SoCal, but we never really talked in SoCal. <laughs> but definitely talked for the first time at the April camp and just kind of slowly worked its way to what it is now. <laughs> nice. So the you guys actually history. dated through the summer then. Yeah. That's nice. But also at the same time, you're just like, I smell terrible and so do you. So let's uh, just not, let's <laughs> uh, just not cuddle up tonight. <laughs> yeah. But overall, uh, like the summer of 2012 was great. Um, that's when I really started to learn a lot more about my hands. Um, definitely started to be a little bit more conceptual with, you know, how my hands move, pressure, fulcrum pressure, hand shape, and yada, yada, yada. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Then moved on. 2013 would have been your next competitive season of indoor, the yeah. Renegade show, oh, which yeah. was a funny... I remember the first time I saw a clip of that show, I was like, dang, they are going in. Like they're going <laughs> they're going hard. Chris Drummer was in that group. Yeah. Who I I think Chris is probably 
the talking about best of the best. I think he's probably the best quad player I've ever seen in my life. He's he's definitely like, up there. Yeah, best quad player, best hands I've ever seen play quads ever. Yeah, that's a very short list for me for sure, and he's mm-hmm. right up there. Like him <laughs> and Nick. And like Tim Jackson, and then I don't know. I don't know if anybody else. Is, I don't know, man. It's tough. Yeah, dude. But like, like I watched a, that. There was a. I don't know if you guys know Jeremy Somers too. I yeah, know he Jeremy. was the. He I was know the quad tech at uh, yeah. Blue Coats in twelve when I marched. Yeah, he played the totem solo with the broken four drum. Yeah, yeah dude. <laughs> that guy has. I think him and Chris are on the same level in terms of just sheer quality and, and quad chops in general. Like, I don't understand how they can move their hands that fast and sound that good. It's like an alien. Yeah, that totally defies physics and everything that should go along with that. It's ridiculous. I feel like that when I watch most quad drummers. I'm like, yeah, uh, there's a reason I gravitated to snare drum. Like, I just yeah. I just don't think, even though people have told me because I have, like, longer skinny arms and I'm kind of a taller guy, like, I might have worked out well on quads, but I just don't think, like, it just blows my mind to watch the crazy stuff that those guys can do. It's just wild. So we'll blow through this a little bit. Uh, 13 indoor WGI, Renegade, 13 outdoor. What made you, you jumped to Blue Coats. What inspired that or led to that? Or It was a simple phone call from Mike Jackson. Um, <laughs> when Mike calls, you answer. Yeah. Ex- well, I didn't even know it was Mike at the time, to be honest. It was just an, a 909 Orange County number and... Funny story, I was actually signing or like filling out an application to work at Rubio's that summer. And then I'm literally about to sign my name and go turn it in to the, to the manager or whatever. And I get a phone call. I'm like, oh, I should just take this, whatever. Turns out it's Mike Jackson. He's like, hey, we have two spots open. Do you want to come fill it? And I was like, whoa, um, yes, but let me figure some stuff out. <laughs> so long story short, that ended up working itself out ended up going and the rest is history for that 2013 year that was a uh, interesting summer for the blue coast snare line yeah. our most or actually our last podcast was with frankie mm-hmm. who ended up being the center that year it was like an all rookie snare line from a blue coast perspective mm-hmm. yep. um no vets in the snare line joe was supposed to be there mm-hmm. injury thing happened um but that summer i feel like was a roller coaster for that group Quad line, super talented, snare line, green for blue coats, but not an experience for drum corps, uh, yeah. definitely. And it was a super challenging show, so I feel like that one took you guys the whole the whole summer to figure out. But definitely, I just remember they came around like seeing the drill for the first time from thirteen, and just thanking my lucky stars like that was the drill, like the year before in twelve. Right, <laughs> it was a I- lot harder. Yeah, that was definitely more than I bargained for, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I had never really, like, I didn't watch uh, on the field coach from the year before. I would only watch a lot videos and whatnot, so I didn't get a comparison between the two. But from what I had just done at Mandarin's the year before, which was, you know, a walk in the park compared to what I did to 2013, that, that was more than I bargained for. Definitely well, helped out a lot. And I definitely lost a lot of weight because of it. That was awesome. So Yeah. Well, if you had watched <laughs> the drill from 2012, you'd have said, man, how did I get unlucky? What, the, what is right? this? Like, dude, our drill, like the end of move-ins, like not the end, but we did our first full run, I think, like the end of the second week of move-ins or something. And usually, you know, your first full run, it like kicks the crap out of you, basically. You're like dying right. by the end of it. We finished it, and like the whole snare line were age outs, and then Joe, who was his third year in the Blue Coast snare line, we got done, and we all just kind of looked at each other, took a deep breath, and went, "All right, this is gonna be a pretty fun summer, guys." Because <laughs> like it, it wasn't, it just wasn't hard. We got lucky. Right. But you know what? That's it. Never hurt not us. How I once. felt after my first run at Crown. <laughs> I, I want to say that again, like. It never hurt us competitively once. Like there was never a judge that docked us for it. Like visual judges never called us out. Like I don't think the battery <laughs> needs to run. I re- I just don't. Maybe in a couple that, spots. That Pick perfect. your spots. Yeah, that's perfectly represented with how things are going nowadays. Like if things are if things are way too hard, but you're not good, then you're not going to get the reward for it. Yep. But if yeah. you're you know, if you're going twelve to five, 
and parking and barking for 64 counts or whatever, and you're really good, then you'll get credit. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Less so is Coach more. 13, through the winter, did Pulse 14, won mm-hmm. a gold medal with the box show. Yep. Uh, um, it's the, what's it called? Uh, oh, my gosh. What was the name of that show? Oh, That Which Confines Us. That Which Confines Us. Okay. Okay. Yeah. About this show, so I don't forget <laughs> Was it harder to hang upside down and play snare drum? No, actually, it's really not hard at all, to be honest. I think That's the all- hardest part is just not freaking out that you're upside down for one, and then you know if you start to get a little bit of a head rush again, not freaking out. That's pretty much it. Gravity, yeah. you have to work with, you know, against gravity, it's yeah. whatever. But it really isn't the end of the world at that point. Um, we did a couple reps beforehand. There's a a video on YouTube, I think, of us like doing our a couple of our exercises upside down. Didn't feel bad at all. Felt great, but <laughs> it's, it's not as hard as people might think. I mean, I remember seeing Dude, it and going those upstrokes. Those upstrokes probably felt great. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I tell you though, man. And there's a lot of speculation out there. I don't know about nowadays, but there was at the time. But people were like, "Oh, that was complete garbage on finals night," and I will tell you. It was not good on finals night. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I can you still won. The things so, that aren't whatever. good on finals night. So. Oh yeah, <laughs> we would have won if we had played better on finals night. Anyway, uh, probably, uh, that's all right. probably. Fast I'll back there, that I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of groups that could say that though. We would have won if we played better on finals night. Like, well, all right, fair enough. That's true. But you guys did win. Got the gold medal. Awesome. Uh, move through to probably one of the most iconic blue coat shows of late, uh, 2014 Tilt. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's many people in high school bando world that have not seen that show. Love that show, great show. Just like a universal concept, like everybody gets it portrayed super well uh, from a design standpoint. Just integrated throughout the show in any way possible. Um, but again, back in a section leader role. That summer seemed like it was just, from an outside perspective, a lot of fun to be involved in that production. Yeah, I think, especially the design process, the design process was was really fun. Um, John Vanderkoff and Jim Moore and Mike Fanning did a great job of putting the whole thing together. Um, they were really, really hands-on. They didn't they weren't just the typical, let's give you some dot sheets and let's just try and make it happen and hope, hope for the best. You know? They were really good about coming out a lot, being very hands-on, you know, try version F, you know, let's go through A through F, um, see if that works, and if not, we're going to try out version G tomorrow, you know, just stuff like that. So they were great. They, were, they did a really good job. In terms of the, the drum line and whatnot, it was a lot of fun, uh, a lot of personalities. It was Definitely a challenge for sure, as any summer is, but it was, again, a collective effort to be able to get through the summer and and be as good as we were at the end. Um, Again, one of the more intimidating seasons I've ever had to march, you know, again, with Ruel being a very experienced um, member with the Bluecoats in general and being a really good musician. Tommy Rome, who, again, very good musician. Uh, very experienced with the drum corps. It, w- it was hard. It was very hard, and I almost felt like, I'll admit this for sure, Like I definitely wasn't the best section leader, but the guidance of them too helping me out, and then the support of everyone else really helped the summer be what it was, which was fun. Yeah, that was a great show. Uh, Jason was in there with you guys. Mm-hmm. Um, Ollie who marched with me at Crown in 2010, which is crazy to think about <laughs> that Ollie marched Blue Coats in 09 and then Crown with me no, and then uh, 2014 Glassman. with you. Or, yeah, Glassman, Glassman in 09. In 09. Then he marched Crown with me and then 2014 Blue Coats with you. Dude did so much drum corps. Uh, yeah. Love that guy. He was actually my seat partner in 2010 too. But, uh, yeah, I'm also randomly tagged in some 2014 Blue Coats snare line picture. <laughs> because somebody meant to tag Evan Espanto, right. but 
tagged me instead. And I was like, oh, sweet. <laughs> Where's my medal at? <laughs> right? That's the easiest song in my life. Yeah. Uh, All the glory. None of the work. To me, what, what always struck me about 2014, the, the Blue Coats drum line from that year, was the book just seemed amazing. Like the features, like the writing for the drum features in that show just seemed like any drummer's like dream. Yeah, everything about that book was super comfy and buttery to play. The only gripe I had about it was the Acella Rondo hand-to-hand flams in the drum break. That was it. That was super hard, very difficult to get to actually a chell, but uh, everything else before and after was fantastic. I think there was one point, too, where I was just playing double stops, just trying to figure <laughs> it out and maybe maybe try and throw some Muller in there to to fake the accents. But, hey, you got to do what you yeah, got to do. Exactly. You know, it. I didn't fall out of the sound, so there it was. That's what matters. <laughs> Played the right rhythms. That's what matters. Were, yeah. you on ups or, were you on ups or downs on the split? I was on the downs for sure. Okay, because there's nine of you guys, right? Yeah. All right, so all right, that makes sense. I had the easy stuff. And again, speculation, it was good on finals night. The mics make it sound bad. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> I've had way too many people tell me, hey, was that good or bad? It sounded bad on the recording. Do you have the judges tape? No, I don't. So I can't. Uh, I can't. Oh, actually, I just got the judges tape for Vanguard this summer the other day. I still need to listen to that. Yeah, me too. But... Shout out to, uh, uh, oh God, what was his name? Oh, uh, oh I can, I, I know look, this. I have guy. to look back. I've met this guy multiple times. I'm getting my phone. I'm just blanking right now. But yeah, he sent us the judges <laughs> tape for this summer. Um, so did the uh, Blue Coast 14, and then your age out was 15 mm-hmm. of uh, Pulse. And I'm not going to lie, when I saw that you aged out of Pulse in 15, I was like, Dang, I don't remember this show at all. The only two things that I remember from the 2015 indoor year were that Rhythm X March 11 snare drums, which is mind boggling. (laughs) And then that was the Guardians of the Breath show for RCC, which is one of my favorite shows of all time. So that made sense. I was like, that's all I can remember from this winter (laughs) season. (laughs) That's totally fair. I either get one of two things. Either I don't remember that show from Pulse 15 or it was my favorite show ever. (laughs) <laughs> just there's no in between like oh i kind of liked it or not it was just either i don't remember it or it was my favorite show but that Which, was you might have just said this but it. i was looking at my phone what show was that uh behind the warped lens i don't remember it <laughs> that's fair uh, yep that's all right <laughs> i went back and watched it though because i was like i don't remember this and i was like oh yeah they do play those really fast singles <laughs> yeah yeah that was actually pretty crazy the first time he did that was it was the quad pretty- player right yeah, he okay. was the second leader at Blue Stars the year before. Greg Power. <laughs> Just like, I was like, well, that's yeah. impressive. Well, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> he played it for the first time, and all of us just kind of stood there in disbelief and looked at each other like, what the heck just happened? <laughs> <laughs> How do you move the sticks so fast? Yeah, that was that was a, an, interesting, an interesting winter, to say the least. A lot of youngins. <laughs> it's the... the complete opposite sides of the spectrum either really young or pretty seasoned and ready to age out sort of thing gotcha um, gotcha it was so, it was an interesting dynamic so before we've gone through your whole like marching career at this point i feel like did we miss anything mm-hmm. i don't think we did i think we touched on everything but either way before we move on to your teaching career since aging out do you have any like really funny audition stories or Really just funny things that happened during any of your seasons? Gosh, dude. I know uh, that's like a tall ask just because there's probably so many and we all have so many new stories from all of our se- seasons and everything, but I feel obligated to ask. Oh, man. I mean, obviously, like, the go-to is rookie talent and all that, but oh, I feel Let's like I'm not out. necessarily... Exactly. I was going <laughs> to say, I'm not necessarily... I don't think authorized to say any of that. Um, gosh, they were just like yeah. Ridiculous. I think a lot of I think a lot of drum corps would be shut down if they had gone back through rookie talent. So yeah, okay, yeah. Man. they don't really do. Think, they don't allow it anymore, do they? No, not that I can remember. Yeah, I don't think they do, which is probably a good thing if we're being honest. Yeah, 
honestly, I don't have anything that immediately comes to mind that was super, super funny. Got any good so, Mike Jackson stories? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I'm putting him on the spot. We can come back to it later. We can move on to your teaching, and if something comes to you, we can get back to it. But I think, I think it'll probably be one of those where I'm mid-conversation, and then I'm like, oh, that was it, and then I'll probably right, end up right. blurting it. Out. It so may we'll, be a we'll good push segue because you did – you did teach with Mike, but like you, so we capped off performance career, moving into the teaching world, which is a whole new ball game of like anxiety and pressure and responsibility in and of itself, mentally draining, uh, obviously more than physically, just because you're not being asked to do it and move and play, um, but aged out. Then you got into te- teaching at BK. Was that right? Yeah, that was my first um, teaching experience coming out of drum corps and whatnot. Uh, credit was that 2015? Nicole. Yeah, credit to Nicole Casino for bringing me on board at that point. Obviously, Mike Jackson and the rest of the staff there, too. But um, that was... Was that their first summer at BK? That was their second. Okay. Yeah, they had had the... Uh, gosh, that one second. That was the year before. Okay. Year before that show. That was... yeah. Super sick book, very simplistic. It was awesome. Um, but yeah, so that was my first drum corps teaching experience. A lot of bumps and bruises again along the way. My first actual experience teaching outside of what I had mainly been taught, which was a lot of the pulse stuff. So it was just me trying to re emphasize that and trying to find my voice using that information. So um, that summer was a lot of a lot of growing pains for me, just in terms of my verbiage, my use of language, my use of, uh, I guess, teaching style in general. So it was a lot of growth, to say the least. Yeah, man, I. It makes you work so hard teaching to sit down and analyze what you heard, and then articulate what you want a kid to do mm-hmm. to get them to achieve the result that, that you want them to res- to achieve in order to like make this cohesive unit. It's, it's mind taxing. It's a mentally taxing thing to do. Um, something that I never experienced, especially like I'd given like private lessons and stuff. And I feel like those were pretty simplistic because a lot of it was very basic. You're teaching kids like, oh, this is how you play downstrokes. This is how you play upstrokes, that sort of thing. But when you're in like a, a world-class caliber setting like that, like the pressure kind of sits on you. Like I got to give high quality information. Yeah. Now, not only that, you also have to deal with the personalities of, uh, of actual adults too. Like you have people coming out of high school or in their first or second year of college that have their own opinions and they're starting to develop their own voice. So then you have to start dealing with the personalities, too, of how they um, receive information and how they apply it or don't apply it or if they are paying attention or not paying attention, you know, um, being able to handle that and have people skills along with having to deal with, am I saying the right information? Am I saying it the correct way? You know, is my body language, I guess, indicative of what I'm trying to get across and whatnot? So all of those things just kind of piling on top of each other really takes a a mental toll at the end of the day as long as you do a good job of reflecting at the end of the day and saying, how can I make myself better for these kids the next day? For sure. And Taha touched on that too with the podcast we had done with him Mm -hmm. that just uh, Mike and I I don't know if she was there when you were there, but I think she was the girl that had been like the battery. Veronica. Yeah, Yeah, Veronica Mm -hmm. um, just had such a good grasp on how to psychologically work with the kids Mm -hmm. in a professional and just calming way, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't remember exactly how he described it, but I just remember him talking about like they their personalities were so good at locking in on what the group of kids any given year required whether it was to be pushed or to like sit back at a moment and just be like, all right, let's just, let's chill out for a second. And that's an interesting dynamic to navigate year to year with any ensemble. Like, Oh, this group needs to be pushed super hard and they need to get really amped up in order to play. Or this group is like really experienced and maybe they don't need to get super fired up. They can't handle it well uh, because then it causes them to just like not control the energy. 
and so that's you got it takes a while to figure that stuff out totally i think, I think, I think that ability uh, that ability to manage your members mental states is one of the main things that separates that top tier of drum lines or groups in general from the tier below like those tier one percussion sections like i would put mike jackson's groups in there uh roger carter's blue coast groups crown now like blue devils those people i've heard that from multiple people that have marched under those staffs like they're just great at reading you like what do you need at this current moment to get the most out of you as a performer and i think that's like the next level for lack of a better way to put it that's totally accurate i think um that really does separate, quote unquote, the men from the boys at that point where you know how to read someone just by looking at their body language and seeing how they walk out of the gym that morning with their water jug and their backpack going to block. Like, oh, are they in, you know, are they kind of poopy faced? Are they not having that great of a morning? OK, so then how am I going to change their perceptive on how or sorry, on their per, uh, perspective on how the day is about to go? You know, so you have to kind of game plan almost on the fly sometimes too. And again, that kind of, like you guys said, puts the groups up into that top tier. For sure. So, so did a few summers at the Blue Nights with Mike Jackson, mm -hmm. then ended up teaching a couple summers at Mandarin's with Ike Jackson. Yep. Uh, did Ike, I don't know, obviously, I don't know Ike at all. Never met him, never talked to him. I've seen some videos of like interviews he's done, which is not always a great way to interpret a dude's personality in like a five minute clip of their life. Uh, but he just seems like a dude who's just like, I'm going to do my thing. I don't care what anybody else thinks about what I do or how I do it, but I'm just going to do this. Uh, what was it like there being with the Mandarins or being with him or being with that group? Um, yeah, it was, it was honestly a great time. Um, the whole thing with Ike, uh, you nailed it right on the head. I mean, that's just how he is. He's going to do what he wants to do, and if he offends people, then, you know, tough luck. It is what it is. Um, but that's that's just how he rolls. And that's worked with Ayala, you know, in terms of their show yeah. design, and that definitely reflects in their kids. They're very strong mentally. They're very strong physically, for sure. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen their posts on facebook or something or <laughs> doing like p90x or something exactly they're doing crossfit like legit crossfit i love it right or rehearsal for an hour and a half so that's just the the kind of that's just the kind of personality that he is and it's great you know it translates well well to the kids um he's a very great motivator um really puts that quote-unquote carrot out in front of you for you to chase it in terms of working with the Mandarins, it was a great time. It was the past three years were a huge step towards where they probably want to go every single year. Um, the percussion staff was lights out every single year, teaching with everyone, learning from everyone. Uh, Darren Vanderpol, who used to be the snare tech at PC, who's the snare tech at Ayala, he's uh, he's a very very organized individual who I learned from a lot. And that was a huge inspiration for me, at least, to, to better myself every day while I was there, to be honest. Um, was it hard? For sure. Because he runs on a motor that I can't run on all the time. <laughs> but, um, yeah, man. He made it a great time. I, wasn't I mean, you guys broke the group in, right? You broke yeah. them into finals. Yeah. Um, design team did a great job. Um, the staff really worked hard. The members, for sure put in their time um so definitely a bunch of credit to all of those involved uh, it was a great time it really was nice i love those shows uh super fun innovative easy to watch from a fan's perspective whether that's like because no offense like they were some of the earlier shows in finals which is what i watched yeah no worries. Uh, but sometimes the deeper into finals i get i'm like the fourth, the like sixth, fifth, fourth place groups. I'm like, oh, I'm still watching band. All right. Yeah. <laughs> but I always enjoyed those shows. Mm -hmm. Cool. And Definitely. I really liked the way they played, which may be a good segue anyway, but I felt like the approach to the drum was one where they played with sound quality, 
but not in an over like in an inefficient way or overexerted way because i think there are groups that play with a more harsh sound and definitely groups that play with a maybe too much of a thin sound so i felt like it was a good mix um and maybe that was i don't know just a healthy mix of the staff that were there and what the information that you guys got them and this will segue into like maybe like the your thoughts on like sound quality or playing or grip pressure or this or that or anything like that but yeah i just i it was very refreshing to hear even though it was inside this year when we saw you guys and it was a terrible experience but (laughs) i I want to add on to that before we let you respond just my overall impression this season was just relaxed when i would watch you all play everything looked natural everything sounded natural as much as you could tell in the convention center but it just looked comfortable and obviously that's just kind of how i've morphed my teaching and my personal playing which was not always the case uh when i was first getting into the activity and even probably most of when i was in it and it's just it was very refreshing to see that extreme comfort which was a huge like juxtaposition to some of the other groups we saw this season um i just loved it honestly it was just awesome to watch nice i Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. We don't get a whole lot of uh, compliments, which is cool. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> um, so depressing. I I know. I just, as I was saying, and I was realizing, like, wow, that's that's not very happy sounding. Um, <laughs> but yeah, man. I mean, I think we we kind of go hand in hand with not necessarily aesthetic uh, in terms of like how you look in terms of your float and whatnot. Obviously, you want that to be the same for the most part, but. We also focus uh, on a happy medium between what your hand's supposed to look like for the most part and then how that goes hand in hand with the sound quality that you're producing. Um, We like to break everything down first from the general approach of how do you create a crap ton of sound? Like fresh off the bat, like how do you create a ton of sound? And then from there, we hone that into mechanics and minute details of critically thinking about what your hands are supposed to be doing at whatever points or for whatever specific skill sets that we're asking you to play. Um, and then that goes into, you know, how, like where the stick lies in the hand itself, what fingers are supposed to feel the stick in at whatever point in time, how you're playing roles, like what it's supposed to feel like in the left hand. So it all kind of just goes hand in hand uh, in terms of the aesthetic and the quality of sound. Not necessarily the production, because that's going to come in time. But the quality of sound is something that we preach for sure. And I think a lot of times there becomes this debate between East Coast, West Coast, this, that, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the end of the day, it's sound quality. Like that's that's what it boils down to. Um, The motions might not be the same. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe some people equate east coast to a little bit more squared off and west coast to a little bit more rounded fluid floaty but like i feel like those are just motions that happen in between the stick actually striking the drum head but at the end of the day it's still what are you thinking about in between to get the sound quality to resonate out of the drum head and the stick Mm um and yeah, like I like for instance, if you watch like maybe a pulse versus a cadets, there's definitely like maybe a more fluid movement in a pulse, like you do the molar technique, which I can't do at all. I've never, <laughs> never, I've never practiced it at all, but I'm probably sure I can't do it. So maybe in a nutshell, very, very, I'm putting you on the spot here. You don't have to get super detailed, but you're talking like eight on a hand accent tap something like that things that you guys are talking about with your kids whether it's high school pulse open mandarins blue knights whatever group you're in front of like you have to make sure you're doing this to achieve a good sound quality and i know that's kind of like deep but (laughs) oh totally um i think there's a few things that kind of go into that where if we're going to talk about the motion first of all um i like to think about it as you know you're dribbling a basketball right I'm sure all of us heard that at some point. Um, You're just dribbling it with, you know, mostly forearm to start. 
and then the follow through is the most important part after that you know that's how you get that extra little bit of pop out of your sound to create a good amount of full bodied sound right and then for your left hand create the same exact motion the only difference is your left hand is just facing a different way or you're turning the wrist a certain way but in terms of the actual arm itself it's moving the exact same way it shouldn't be going in or out as much as you know i see a lot of people doing nowadays it's not a bad thing it's just a different sound it's a different style it's a different approach but for me i've always heard from glenn crosby um how are your hands going to sound the same if they're not moving the same you know how are your arms going to try and travel out of 45 to the left and out and your your right hand's going to be moving up and down how in good god's name is that going to sound the same you know yeah so besides putting a ton of extra effort into that left hand to try and force that sound in there so i guess that would be the first thing second thing don't be afraid to feel the stick vibrate in the hand like very neutral right you have your little bit of a fulcrum up in the top three fingers or middle two fingers depending on how you teach it you know just let it relax and as long as you have that relaxed arm motion like you're dribbling or shooting a basketball have a nice relaxed neutral hand let the stick vibrate same thing in the left hand but just let the stick sit in the webbing of the hand as opposed to trying to feel any sort of pressure in the fulcrum of the hand you know and i think yeah. for the most part that's pretty much it because that, that kind of takes a lot of different ideolo ideologies and just kind of disperses or kind of i guess breaks them down into two bigger ideas you know yeah for sure i i like to tell my kids and i think we've done a lot of this on the podcast at least with mike and i like asking other people uh their sort of philosophies i love using sports references when i'm teaching kids especially basketball because i feel like it's so fluid and there's so much like motion involved that relates with like pushing a basketball down to the floor and letting it come back up into the hand and like dribbling hand to hand especially like when i'm talking to kids about playing like triplet actions like duck, 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 duck. i was like dude just like dribbling hand to hand right left between mm -hmm. the legs like whatever and just having that sort of like firmness in the hand but not like tense pressure in the hand um so i love that anytime people bring up sports and basketball i'm like yes this is about to be good <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's in, I, I love the fact that you brought up the neutral hand approach and i think that's becoming kind of a universal thing like across the board in the activity indoor and outdoor whereas i would put forth like that wasn't the case like in the 90s 2000s like correct me if i'm wrong evan i i, I would be surprised if like late 90s cadets were preaching neutral hand, just watching them play. I think it's become more prevalent in modern times for people to approach drumming as, are you creating the same sound as the person next to you over, are you moving the exact same way as the person next to you? Fair um, which is just not from a physiological standpoint possible for six foot five snare drummer to move and play the exact same as five foot eight snare drummer standing next to them. They're going to have different shape hands. They're going to have different size hands. They're going to have different weight in the hands. They're going to have different length in their fingers. Like they're probably not going to be able to move the exact same way and produce the exact same sound. Like that's, sure. I don't think that that's, I, I feel like that's where the shift is kind of maybe moving uh, in modern marching percussion, at least in my opinion. Definitely. But what, uh, where I was also going to take that was Frankie said the exact same thing and he works with crown and then Richard saying the same thing about a West coast style group. You can preach the same thing, but the end result, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying this is a, a talk of the, the quality of the groups, more of the approach and the look that results of it. You can talk about the same hand pressure. You can talk about that stuff, but I think the vibe of the two groups is still totally different, but that, concept of neutral hand or that approach to feeling that stick vibrate and holding but not squeezing and so on it is uniform that's mm -hmm. really interesting to me that you can have two completely different results with probably a pretty similar like underlying approach yeah i mean and i think too a lot of times like the vibe or maybe the uh the motion isn't necessarily indicative of the style or the instruction but sometimes, like, 
of the arrangement, like what the arranger is trying to go for mm-hmm. or the type of style the music is calling for. Like if you gave, I don't know, Rhythm X a Pulse book and Pulse a Rhythm X book, like it might not look the same as they do year to year just because what it's being required to do is, is just a little bit different. Um, and that's, I don't know, that's to each his own, like on mm-hmm. what you prefer or like what you like. I mean, that's the artistic nature behind the activity, which is cool. You get to see different styles reflected out of different ideas. So whatever. Yep. But also, all right. So we've been going on about, and this may be a harsh segue or a rough turn, but <laughs> about world-class this and that this and that so california Mm -hmm. in my opinion has a unique i don't know production of high quality drumming from its youth uh not just from maybe the more prolific names that we've all heard that i all sheena hills arcadia this that this and that but just in general Mm -hmm. like and I think a lot of that from maybe talking to some other friends of mine that are out there has to do with some of the setup that happens from an earlier age, which is unique. Uh, definitely not what happens here in Kentucky um, or Ohio, some of our surrounding states, Indiana. But a lot of those kids start marching or getting opened up to the idea of marching percussion at an earlier age. Does that happen at the schools you work with as well? Not necessarily. So – Up in our area, I think we have maybe like a percussion class or, you know, some middle school class periods from time to time. But it's mainly just to get them the fundamentals of, you know, this is a quarter note, this is an eighth note, so on and so forth. We don't actually dive into the whole marking time thing. We don't dive into, you know, obviously we're not diving into like handshape or anything, but we don't even dive into like holding a traditional grip. We don't dive into anything like that. It's literally just, here's a stick. You put it in your hand, try and do something with it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just that's just the nature of it out here. Um, we'll have like percussion ensembles for middle school kids and whatnot, which is definitely a huge help for our area. Um, from where I'm at specifically, like in the Central Coast area, it's like a barren wasteland for talent out here. Um, you'll really start to get nice good talent in the valley next to magic mountain like santa clarita uh valencia area obviously as you get down to the la county and whatnot area they just have everything figured out they have their middle school program set up like uh roland high school has uh alvarado middle school chino hills has townsend ayala has canyon hills and those guys are right off the bat at least for the most part teaching them how to do the gig like they would at the world-class level. They're already preparing them to be world-class. Whereas here, we're just trying to maybe have them be less than junior, I guess. I don't know. It's, it's rough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I feel like that's the case I in most parts of the country. Even, yeah. I feel like even middle school percussion ensemble is a pretty big advantage. Like, mm-hmm. just getting kids outside of oh, we're standing at the back of the room at a concert band, symphonic band, wind ensemble setting, and being able to be a little bit closer to them and give them more one-on-one information, even if it's just like in a percussion ensemble piece where you can dive in a little deeper. Um, I know I've talked to some other friends of mine that work in like Clovis and stuff like that, and they're talking about, yeah, we get them in seventh grade and before school, I have all my kids, and all we do is grid for an hour. And I'm like... All right, that's an anomaly. Um, <laughs> but and then they talk about like, yeah, like the Townsend, like you sit there and you watch these kids that feed the Chino Hills in seventh and eighth grade who already can move their feet in time, which is already a huge plus, and also play eight on a hand, axe and tap, and triplet rolls before they even get to ninth grade. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> That does not exist anywhere near where we live. Um, not at all. Which is is fine, but it's just you see these groups like Chino and I all at Arcadia and Roland and uh, Southern. I think Southern Hills was one I saw the other day. Uh, South Hills, yeah, yeah. And I was just like, man, these kids are so good already. 
but they just get this exposure. It's like, well, it makes sense. This kid who's a junior has been playing snare drum for six years. So yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then to that point too, it's, it's also kind of a, it's kind of a bummer at the same time, only because they, they're so used to just being worked for such a long time that, you know, once you get them past that high school level and they get to that independent level, they almost get burned out. You know, they've yeah. already experienced all of that success and how good they possibly can be. And they've already experienced, you know, what the workload is supposed to be. And then they're like, ah, all right, I think I've done my time. You know, so it, the way I see it, at least out here, is like it's a it's a beautiful thing, but it's also in some cases a detriment to some individuals. Obviously not everyone because it's booming out here in Southern California. Yeah, yeah. I can see that because, I mean, there are plenty of kids who come out of Chino, like the Nicoles and uh, the current kid who's uh, the center at Pulse, uh, Zach, is that his name? Zach, yeah. Who, like, go out and they continue on, but not all of them do. Like, those kids mm -hmm. almost become, like, rock stars for three or four years in, in high school. And then they're like, well... All right, I'm done. I'm, yeah, and they're done that. Even though they were so incredible in high school, it's like, well, they really miss out on this other experience just because, like, oh, I've been playing snare drum for six years now. Like, all right, I'm done. So, yeah, definitely. I get it. Yeah, for sure. Before, so what's next? Before we close this out, we've been going a little over an hour. So, what is what's next for you? Where are you? I don't know where, where are you teaching this summer. What's indoor? <laughs> what are you doing? Well, currently, I am. I am, I am hanging out for a little bit. Um, not at Mandarin's this year. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have already seen the, the Facebook post and whatnot of a little bit of a staff turnaround, but you know, the drum corps is in great hands. Um, taking a, a little time off of winter, just because I definitely enjoy my weekends, uh, and I, I just want to be a spectator for a little bit. You know, I I thoroughly enjoy watching where the activity is going. In terms of where the quality is, um, you know, uh, watching SCPA finals last year, just as a spectator and watching it in the lot was a lot of fun. So I want to. It do can that. be refreshing, man. Just like yeah. sitting back and watching, mm -hmm. like, all right, I'm just gonna take this in. I have no bias. I have no allegiances. I'm just gonna like enjoy this and also like kind of talk shit about some things here and there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but. Uh, so, yeah, man. At least, for, and also, you don't have to make the trek to Dayton when it's cold, dude. Yeah. I cannot imagine going from like rehearsing outside all the time in sunny California, and then you're like, "Oh, we got to go to Dayton for WGF finals." Is it going <laughs> to snow this year? Oh, dang! <laughs> Luckily, every year that I've been there has been pretty nice for the most part. <laughs> 2013 was the only time where it was like pretty freaking cold, but every year uh, besides that. We've either had an indoor facility or it's been nice outside to be able to rehearse outside. So, but I can totally understand where you would be coming from with the whole bad weather thing, <laughs> dude. Most of my finals lots were rough, except for maybe twenty twelve. Twelve was, was good. Okay. Twelve was uh, good weather. Uh, Eleven sucked. Eleven, 11 was sucked. rainy and cold. I Eleven remember that. That was terrible. Ten was, was cold. cold. It's it usually cold. It it's cold. usually cold. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So you we competed gonna... against you in 2012. That's funny. I never thought about that. That's true. Yeah, That's we did. Very... You beat I, us. You beat us. I had to get what I was doing. <laughs> Sorry. Well, well, you beat us. It's all right. <laughs> you uh, did something right. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. No, it's all good. <laughs> I just <laughs> take pulse forever. It's no big deal. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, I guess the last thing I want to ask, at least, is. You mentioned you're going to enjoy being a spectator and everything. Do you like the overall direction that DCI is taking, stepping away from the very traditional drum corps style and moving more towards almost like an indoor show on a football field? Oh, man. Um, I'm going to take the cop-out answer and say yes and no. Um, <laughs> yes, because I, I think everyone enjoys change at some point. I think everyone enjoys evolution of a product. Um, no matter what it is for the most part. Um, and no, because I, I love drum corps for what it used to be, you know? Yeah. Um, I love watching drum corps on ESPN and seeing, uh, you know, the blue devils do the Godfather show and just 
seeing uh yes seeing crown of nine for example I, I love seeing groups like that just ramming away and just doing it really well having that you know regimented sort of style um that's why I always love drum corps as opposed to indoor more. Um, if I could, I mean, if there was one group that I could, <laughs> if there's one group I could have marched during the summer, I feel like it would have been either Crown or Cadets because I just love that style, you know? So I miss that. I would love for the activity to go to that again. But, you know, I'm also happy that there's some sort of evolution happening. Yeah, I see that. I see that. Um See, Evan, we have somebody else that's like me, prefers drum corps to indoor in this day and age. <laughs> I, I was always like, I all, always preferred drum corps over indoor. Like, I didn't even know what indoor was until I was in college. Like, I'd never seen WGI. Like, it was just, I was taught in high school by an old school cadet from the 90s. Like, that was, that was it for me, pretty much. And, uh... Yeah, I just I just did indoor just because it was another opportunity to be in a good snare line was basically what I looked at it as. Yeah, I just love getting my ass beat in the summer when it's <laughs> 112 in July, and I'm in Texas. I love it. There's something like I don't know, just like that, like builds your adrenaline about it. You're just like I'm doing this. I I relish this. This is what I looked up to. Like these dudes, like I watched in rehearsal, just out there, like running and gunning. And now, like I don't know, the endorphins kick in. You're just like, yeah. There's yep. people watching you, like rehearse in the stands. You're like, all right, let's get this. Yeah, I, that, I can relate to that. It's that so, level two fun people talk about. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. I mean, a couple of the days that like stick in my memory from my two summers are like the days. There's one specific day from 2012 where Ryan Kilgore kicked the crap out of the battery after lunch one day at yeah. Denison on our fourth movement because it was like at 196 and it was needed. And then a day where I think it was when we were in Atlanta around the Atlanta regional time, like Tom Monks was on tour and he came out to battery sectionals. The text just threw us a tennis ball around and Tom didn't say hardly anything, but just beat the living crap out of us on a section of the show that was like at 206. And again, same reason we sucked at it, but those two days like stick in my brain more than any other thing that happened on those summers. Yeah, dude, that plays like that build character and they'll, they'll be some of your fondest memories for sure. Yep. You got anything else, Evan? Uh, not off the top of my head, man. Um, yeah. All right, let's not beat it. I was just as warm here as it is there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we've been going for like an hour and ten minutes almost now, so let's not beat this horse anymore. Uh, let's wrap it up. So, Richard, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Hopefully, we'll see you around at something. Well, you're not teaching anywhere, so we might not see you until like a year from now. But hopefully, we will. We'll figure it out. Well, um, we might end up trying to make the trek out to Dayton or to. Uh, DCI finals this year just to go watch so we'll see okay sweet perfect Becky's not too far away from Dayton or Indy that is a true statement and I'm all for bourbon all trails for in it. Kentucky are fun oh, so that's a list <laughs> <laughs> I got an extra bed uh, yeah all right we'll figure this out off 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 the air here so <laughs> thanks everybody for sticking around uh, as always subscribe to the YouTube channel like the video drop a comment if you want to uh, follow us on Instagram. Keep telling your friends. The support's been great from everybody so far. Uh, we're having a blast doing it. Subscribe on iTunes or Spotify, uh, whichever podcast service you prefer. All that stuff helps us immensely. And we will just be back in a few weeks with the next guest. Peace. <laughs>